Hi, Sarah's doggy. <laughs> Sarah's there. Oh, so no, no, it was great to see him, her, him. Oh, oh, he's so cute. <laughs> Jackson. Jackson. Okay, Miriam just filled me in on his name. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, so the refuges and precepts will be on your screen. So I'm going to chant them. And uh, please feel free to, uh, to chant along with me if you, I'm going to be chanting in the Pali language, which is on the left side facing you. And, and so, um, uh, there are some uh, different pronunciations in Pali that maybe um, you, you, you'll hear as I chant. Uh, so feel free to listen, to read the English, to take it in. Um, going for refuge is a, is a really important part of our, our practice. Um, and uh, and it's, it's not something that one does necessarily once a day or, you know, it's, it can be a ritual, uh, a meaningful ritual that one does, you know, initially at a certain time when, when we're committing to practice in a deeper way. Um, it's, but it's something that we can do in any moment when we feel stuck lost, hopeless, we can remember Buddha Dharma Sangha and, and remembering not just the historical Buddha and the, and the Dharma teachings and, and the practice community, but remembering also that these are all embodied within our own being, that our essential nature is Buddha, which means awake, our essential, uh, the, the teachings of the Dharma are unfolding within our own experience moment by moment. And, and the Sangha is first of all, this body in which we, uh, you know, are grounded and rooted and reground ourselves again and again. Uh, our body is our ally, our friend in our practice because, because when we begin to tune into the body and listen, uh, the body really speaks to us and lets us know um, when we're maybe not connected deeply to the heart, to, to our truth, to who we truly are. So, um, yeah, so, um, Taking refuge, uh, it's very, very key. And, um, and the homage is honoring the Buddha. So, so when we honor the Buddha, we have to remember that we're, we're bringing honor to that principle <clears throat> of awakening. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just a historical figure or a person it's we're, we're bringing honor to that principle of awakening in our lives, that this is key, that this is central in our lives. <clears throat> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. <coughs> Udang Saranangachami Tamang Saranangachami Sangang Saranangachami
Dutiam pi budang saranang gachami. Dutiam pi damang saranang gachami. Dutiam pi sanang saranang gachami. Tati ampi budang saranang gachami. Tati ampi damang saranang gachami. Tati ampi sanang saranang gachami. Taking the five precepts is our bringing our intention to the fore to live uh, with a no, an attitude of non-harming. Um, it's, it, it's expressing our respect for all life forms and, um, and our value. And, and, and it's, it's an opportunity to contemplate how not only taking life, but also doing violence such as stealing or lying or using our sexuality in ways that is, is not considerate or thoughtful or uh, respectful is, um, is, is harmful. It, it does violence to the people uh, in our circles of connection so so it's really it's so important to uh to ground ourselves in this attitude of ahimsa non-harming again and again and again uh, and so we remind ourselves of this as we enter into our time of practice together and uh and so also just uh another another way that we can contemplate these is not only what are the um, actions of, of harm that we want to refrain from and restrain ourselves from, but, but also how can we cultivate the positive qualities such as supporting life and the speaking the truth uh, from our heart with kindness <clears throat> uh, and skill. Uh, so these are also things that you can bring to your engagement with these precepts. Hanati pata veramani sikapadam samadhyami adina dana veramani sikapadam samadhyami Kame su mi chachara wera mani sika padam samadiyami. Musa wada wera mani sika padam samadiyami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana Vera Mani Sika Padam Samadiyami Idam Me Silam Maga Fala Nyanasa Pachayo Hotu Sadhu 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 Anumodami.
so so we've been um, for those who are just joining us for the first time welcome um, we always are we generally speaking we are working with some topics uh, some of the Dharma particular Dharma teachings and since September um, we've been just working our way through the Satipatthana Sutta the four establishments of mindfulness and um, so each each of the each of the talks you know you don't have to have heard the previous talks to understand and um, uh, and work with the the topic um, that I present on, on a particular day uh, so we're we're in the fourth Satipatthana, which is mindfulness of dhammas. Uh, so sometimes dhammas is uh, translated as mental formations or formations. Um, mo most teachers like using the just the Pali word because it's not just mental formations, but we experience these formations in the body as well. So it's um, it's it's better. Some some Pali words have you know a lot of nuance or a lot of uh, uh, in inclusiveness in what they mean. So sometimes it's better to to use the Pali word and um, and just begin to uh, educate ourselves as to what that means. <laughs> so there are five. The the first of the dhammas in in this chapter of this uh, discourse, the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, or for four establishments of mindfulness. So we're in chapter four and, um, and the first of the sections in chapter four is on what are called the five hindrances. And, um, and they're called hindrances because uh, they are obstructions to our ability to, to really be present and mindful, uh, to focus our attention, to steady our attention, uh, so in that way, they're, um, they're, they're problems, but they're not real problems because uh, they're also opportunities. Like it's that every problem is an opportunity or what we may see as a problem is truly an opportunity. And, um, and so uh, I, I, I like to think of them that way because for me, the work with the hindrances has been doorways into deeper understanding of uh, this mind, uh, this mind body, and um, and have uh, really, you know, opened insights for me into um, how I'm caught and how I can let go uh, and uh, be more free. So this, so we're on the fifth of the hindrances, which is uh, doubt. So um, the previous four hindrances are. Uh, uh, sense desire, aversion, sloth and torpor, and restlessness uh, and and worry. Uh, so, just for those who may not be familiar with these uh, this category of teachings, um, so doubt is uh, it's it's a it's a kind of a hindrance that can be experienced in different ways, uh, and um, and sometimes, you know, when we're sitting, and we may be uh, recollecting the teachings, you know, if the mind is not caught up in, uh, you know, discursive thought, which happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's 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 a normal part of meditation uh, that we that the mind may be caught up in, in thinking about past or future or, you know, um, or fantasy or, uh, and so on. And, and so, and so we, we address that by coming back to the body, to the breath. Uh, so sometimes though, questions may come up about, you know, teachings that we're remembering. And, um, and that can be experienced as doubt, uh, what does this mean? Um, and so it's, it's not that useful to, to um, engage in reflecting when we're 
actually in our formal meditation practice on what does this mean conceptually. Uh, so it's good if you can just put that aside and say, I'm going to look into that later. I'm going to, you know, read, read a book or consult a teacher or whatever it is that you might do. Um, uh, sometimes uh, doubt can be that something's come up in our practice, um, maybe fear or, or sleepiness, uh, and, and we're not sure how to work with it. Uh, so that, that sense of uncertainty of not, you know, not knowing, well, what's, you know, what's the skillful response to this, what seems like a difficulty in my practice. And, um, and so in that case, it's actually really uh, helpful to engage with it uh, and to say, well, you know, I, I'm not actually remembering specific teachings about how to work with this, but I'm going to engage with it. You know, I mean, generally just uh, investigation, like turning toward it. What's the nature of this? How is this known in the body? In fact, in the classic Pali, early Buddhist teachings, investigation is the way of working with doubt. So like, um, like just noticing how doubt what, what is that energy of doubt? You know, how does it, how does it live in this body? Uh, at, or, or noticing um, uh, when, I, when I just come back to the breath, if I can, you know, be present in the body, be present in kind of what grounds me in my practice, in, uh, feeling the whole body, the, the impermanent nature of the body, how sensations come and go and so on. You know, does this, does the doubt uh, kind of diminish or can I let go of that and just bring my energy, my full energy to practice? So, so investigation on how to work with doubt, you know, perhaps uh, arousing metta, uh, loving kindness, you know, but like that's, that's uh, something that, you know, e even, even if I'm not certain, grounding ourselves in that care for ourselves, that friendship, attitude of friendship and love for ourselves is, is always beneficial. So, so in, in working with doubt in this way, uh, exploring, perhaps finding what is helpful, what is not helpful, we develop a, a kind of self-reliance. And that's really important in our practice to, to develop a self-reliance that, because it's, we're not practicing this to develop dependence on the teacher, on books, on, it's, it's really to, to find uh, that that um, clarity uh, within our our own being, within this heart, mind, uh, body that we inhabit, that we are, and and to to dwell in that, to to strengthen in that, to ground ourselves in that. Um, not self reliance in I don't need anybody. That's not what I'm talking about, but but that, yeah, wisdom lives here. <laughs> you know, uh, love lives here, compassion lives here, um, acceptance lives here. Uh, and so that quality of, of self-reliance um, and, um, and so uh, the, the, and, then, and then there's another, Part of doubt, which for me is the most uh, potent um, in my working with doubt, uh, which is um, addressing self-doubt. Uh, and for me, um, this 
capacity to, to trust, to connect, to, to, um, to turn inwards and, and abide in a, a sense of being grounded in uh, inner wisdom and peace. Uh, that's something that has, has grown over the course of my practice a lot. And, um, and I would say that when I began practice, uh, I experienced a lot of confusion and uh, like I would hear teachings, this kind of teaching, well, is that right? And then another teaching, oh, that sounds really different, you know? And, and the sense of being ungrounded and, and needing to verify my own experience and my own um, understanding and my own uh, knowing um, with others. And then of course, finding that you never, you know, if you can hear somebody saying or, or read somebody saying one thing, then, you know, sure is, you know, the sky is blue, you can uh, hear somebody else saying something different. And, uh, and so, so that, um, that verification, that inner verification is, uh, it's, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, uh, yeah, a phrase that Matt used to use, uh, or probably still does, uh, self-validating, that our experience is self-validating, that that an insight, a recognition that this is so, you know, as, you know, as maybe we get let go of something that we've been holding on to, or, or we see into the nature of, of, of the struggle that's going on within us, or, um, or we see into some condition that there's a, an insight that is self-validating. Um, it doesn't mean that our understanding can't be enhanced and developed and expanded uh, always, always. Uh, this is a lifelong journey. Uh, and, um, and we, uh, I, it's, it, for me, uh, this, this recognition that um, being in, in deep connection, in a strong connection with um, awareness, with knowing, it's, it's my home, it's my home base. And, and so, uh, you know, so when I feel confused, um, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to just collect myself and and yeah, find that that uh, that place of silence because yeah, that knowing is is not a place of lots of words. <laughs> it's uh, it's a place of silence and steadiness. So um, so that uh, that doubt um, that we can doubt our own capacity to. Uh, to, to know, to, uh, to choose, to, to, to realize the teachings is, um, is so important uh, to, to address, to, to look at and to, re, to build that reconnection with our heart. And when I say reconnection, uh, you know, I think it's something that we lose over time, you know, that um, there's a way in which 
It's not that every three-year-old is enlightened, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something that we, just that groundedness and, and presence to ourselves that, that we lose um, with language, with sophistication, with concepts, with, with so many ideas, uh, right and wrong, um, dualities. And, uh, and so that coming home to uh, a steadiness of knowing is a, uh, a coming home to who we truly are and to clarity to, and we can, to, to abiding in that, in that uh, confidence. So, um, so that's something to explore you know, as we as we sit together and and in the weeks to come. Uh, it's how how does doubt arise in you, and 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 how has it arisen in you, and how has it created <clears throat> an instability or unsteadiness or. Um, a uh, feeling of helplessness, uh, confusion. And, and, and where are you in your practice? Has, has your practice addressed that? Uh, um, and, and what comes up in terms of doubt? How does doubt show itself? Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to move into our meditation practice. Uh, so please take a minute to stretch. And, and I, I'm just realizing that the bright lights are on. They were here with yeah, on. Yeah, I, well, I dimmed them a little bit, but I wasn't sure for the computer. Yeah, no, I phone. usually just. I'll happily take them off. Yeah, <laughs> please. Yeah, they're touch too bright. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's better. And, and I still quite visible on the screen. It's fine. Thank you. Yeah. So as we begin our meditation, <clears throat> let's ground ourselves in our seat. So I use the word seat and it can describe any posture, uh, lying down, standing up, sitting on a chair, sitting on a bench, a cushion, but we're engaging in the body on Mother Earth. We're here on Mother Earth. And as we ground ourselves, feeling the body balanced, held, supported, Let's bring, let's begin by bringing gratitude to our mother 
the earth, the whole earth system. So we're earth creatures, not just of the ground, but of the air and the water, space, the fire, the sun, the stars, all of the, all of the cosmos. We are, we are siblings, we are kindred in that family of the earth. Honoring our ancestors, the ancestors who lived here for millennia, wherever here is for you, here in Montreal, Chichaga, in the Kenyankahaga language, this area, a gathering place for many people, <clears throat> and still is a gathering place for many peoples. Many peoples coming to this place for so many reasons, including seeking safety from harm, oppression. And also honoring our own ancestors in our biological lineages and our spiritual ancestors of this, these teachings Whatever lineages may be nourishing you, the early Buddhist teachings, perhaps other lineages as well, um, Buddhist and other spiritual traditions. We can bring gratitude that these teachings are still here and alive for us. And that by practicing them, we become an ancestor who holds the lineage, who keeps the lineage alive in our practice, in our bodies, in our hearts and tensions. Honoring that whole process of lineage transmission and holding and preserving. So as we're sitting on the earth, finding a posture that's balanced and energized, if you're sitting on a chair, you're lifting from the base of the, of the spine through the crown of the skull. And letting the body relax around that central axis Relaxing the face, the eyes, the jaw, the base of the skull. The throat. The shoulders. heart, the 
the diaphragm. back, shoulder blades, lower back. Lower abdomen. The whole pelvic area. Thighs. Knees and lower legs. And the feet. Noticing the sense of stillness in the body. Not that the body has to be perfectly still. There's a quality of stillness as the body relaxes and sits upright. Settledness. Feeling the whole body. Opening your, way you're tuning your attention rather than having a very narrow attention on a particular place in the body where you feel the breath. Try opening up to feeling the whole body sitting in whatever sitting or lying down, whatever posture it is. Opening up a whole body awareness. And letting the breath the gentle motion of the breath, perhaps the light sensation of the breath, be a part of that whole body awareness. You may notice as you bring attention to the whole body, um, a, a place of tightness or contraction. 
So you can bring your attention there if you find that. Maybe your jaw or your shoulders. And just breathing into that place and inviting the contraction to release, not requiring it or making it a something you need to achieve, but just a gentle invitation to release. And if you find that there's some place of discomfort and there's a, a holding around that place, again, you can soften your attention let the discomfort be held or let it just be known in a, a wider field. And we may notice as the body mm -hmm. relaxes, if it is relaxing and calms down, feeling less tightness, feeling less contraction. This also helps the mind to become more settled. and to be more present, to show up in this moment. And one of Bhikkhu and Alio's beautiful teachings is that when we are showing up in this moment with mindfulness, with attention, with openness, without judgment, kindness. There's a quality of joy, subtle joy that we can discover. Just that joy of the present moment, being present, being alive in this moment. As Thich Nhat Hanh would say, happiness is available, help yourself. This quality of being present, embodied, collected, is a, a way of, it's a kind of coming home. I think it's the deepest sense of coming home. Coming home to ourselves. And it's the sense of abiding within, abiding at home in the body, in the heart, in the mind. That is the 
true antidote to doubt, self-doubt, confusion, When we know this contentment, this peace, this stability of finding a home within ourselves, the various things that may contradict or confuse us don't matter. They may be of interest in a certain way, but essentially they don't matter. What is right and what is wrong? What is the precise meaning of this or that? We can love to dance with the teachings, play with the teachings, explore them deeply. They're all in the service of coming home, being free, finding freedom within this abiding.
doubt can manifest as this kind of nagging question, am I doing it right? Am I practicing right? My mind keeps wandering. I'll never get this. Or sometimes doubt can come in as a kind of a harsh voice saying, you messed up. It can be different kinds of energies, but doubt can be there as part of it. You messed up and it undermines our confidence in ourselves. Memory comes in of how we responded. We think we didn't respond well, we reacted. Oh, you messed up and just can't do this or you're not getting it. You don't have a good practice. All of these harsh voices, when we recognize it as as a hindrance, that it's not the truth, it's something that is a conditioned dhamma that somehow we're we have this voice that is criticizing us and undermining our confidence in ourselves in our practice and we can begin again we can let that go put it aside not with harshness we don't need to respond to harshness with harshness, but with kindness. Sometimes those harsh voices are in some kind of mixed up way, trying to help us do better, but it's, it's not skillful. We, we can find better ways to to progress, to develop, to mature as human beings. <clears throat> and and a, a good response to that is, is really calling forth love to ourselves, for ourselves. In whatever way resonates for you, simply saying the word, I love myself. or just inviting that quality of love, that energy of love to flow through the body, mind, heart. Just uh, saturating ourselves, radiating through us, whatever image is potent for you, that quality of love. Filling this being. Loving ourselves in our imperfections. We don't need to be perfect to be loved by ourselves or by others.
And as we come to the end of our practice together, our formal practice, Let's bring that quality of metta, of love, of am amour, of kindness, of care, of friendship. Let's invite you to just call it forth within your being in whatever way you can, if it, whatever way is most effective for you, if it's saying some phrases such as may i be may i be well may i be be at peace may i be free from suffering may i live with ease and well-being on this earth or simply saying the word metta or love or amor. Letting that radiate within you, like a luminosity, perhaps, or an energy, and beyond you, filling the field around you to include those who are present with you, present in this practice, in the space that you're living in, in the space that we're practicing in, and beyond building into the streets, encompassing all beings, human and non-human, visible and invisible, those that are being born and those that are dying. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free. And let's dedicate our practice as we have practiced in our formal meditation and also in our daily lives, that our practice may serve and support the happiness, well being, and liberation of all beings. <laughs>